Francesca is our guest speaker tonight. She is a teacher, author and historian. She is a foundation member of the Coazid History Group and was a committee member for 10 years. Her topic tonight is World War II and Australians Italians, internment, the home front and finding your family's history. Um, okay then, so we'll start off with um, what I'm going to cover tonight and that is primarily looking at what, what it was like for being an, an, an Italian in Australia or an Italian Australian during World War II and I know there's lots of people in this room who lived during that period and have lots of stories to tell so I hope at the end that we'll be able to perhaps you know, be able to share some of those. So looking at the home front, what it was like to be an average person living in Australia at the time of Italian heritage, then we'll look at internment, um, because that affected more than 5,000, um, well, 10% of the Italian community was held captive during World War II. And also, whilst I'm doing that, I want to talk about the records and how easy it is to find these records, uh, particularly now with the internet, everything is at a finger, just a click away these days. All right, um, let's start at the pre-war period in Australia. This is an interesting photograph. This is a photograph of the the branch of the Italian Fascist Party in Sydney. And this was taken in the 30s, late 30s, at Potts Point. Seems to be a place where political people like to live. Anyway, it was taken at the consul, vice consul's home, which was uh, over there at the time. This is a reflection of, well, basically nearly probably everybody in this photo would have been interned. This group was formed in 1927. It was Mussolini's idea to let's try and get uh, in contact with all the, f the Italians living abroad. Uh, mostly because they had money and they could send money back to Italy and help him with his great campaigns and he was going to conquer the world and all these deluded ideas. Uh, some of you, does anyone recognise anybody in this photo? <laughs> Okay. Randolph standing next Yes. Yes. Her cousin. Your cousin. <laughs> so this was the, the the main branch of the fascist party called the Luigi Platania, named after a fascist martyr, and they also had a female branch, and she, Miss Caterina Stussy, was in charge of that. Um, this fellow here. <coughs> Does anyone know who he is? We'll talk about him a little bit more. His name was Prince Alfonso de Drago. He was a, of Italian nobility. You know all about him? And we'll talk about him because, of course, he was interned and became the camp leader. And next to him is uh, Mr. Vitaglione, yep. holding the flag. Well, I sort of argue that most of these people in the photograph were not... Were not they, were, they were sentimental... Italians, they were not really political. No. No. I give Italian a uniform, give them a title, and they're happy. <laughs> and, and you can just imagine, you know, they thought that this was something to join. Remember, this is assimilation. Uh, you are not allowed to, you know, be overt about your culture. So, of course, there's a group that comes along and says, guess what, come along, we're going to teach you how to be children Italian. We're going to uh, have after-work activities and we're going to teach you fencing and we're going to teach you, we're going to have these picnics and we're going to do this and then of course they all thought, oh this is great. Mm -hmm. And remember that Italian fascism was not a negative thing in Australian society mm -hmm. in, up until Abyssinia, then things changed. What, what year was it? Uh, I think it was, uh, I'm not 100% sure, I think it may be in the 30s, mid 30s, 30, this yeah. one. Um, yes, so most of these people were sentimental, they were in getting involved because of all these other activities, uh, and not political in the way that it turned out to be. Some of you may have heard of the man called Franco Battistessa, he was a very famous journalist. Well, he was seen as too extreme, and they kicked him out of the fascist party, because he was, he's not there, he must have got kicked out by that stage, I don't know. All right. 
To give you an idea of the kinds of things that were happening in the 30s with Italian, this is a copy of, um, there was two Italian newspapers in the 30s, one was called Italo Australian, the other one was called the uh, Il Giornale Italiano, both were fascist papers so to speak. You can find all this on the internet now. Um, does anyone know what this might be about? Yeah, they're raising money that people were donating their jewellery. That's right. The cause. So Mussolini asked for the women to send their wedding rings. That was all symbolic. And sent their jewellery. And of course, the Italians of Sydney did so. And you can go through these newspapers and there's lists and lists. Yep. I put this up there because there's all Aeolian names and I thought most of you will be related to some of them here. But as you can see, and this was the kind of thing. They just, and they put your name in the paper with what you donated, so then they sold more papers. These newspaper articles became very um, helpful when it was time to call Italians up to be interned and to try and do a... They went back through all the newspapers, found all these names. They were their worst enemy because everybody whose name was here would be in trouble. So anyway, these are very easy to find. And if you go onto a website called Trove, National Library of Australia, they digitise uh, these newspapers now. One of them, the other Italian newspaper is still hard copy. You have to go and look at it. But all you have to do is go to this website, um, newspapers, Sydney Morning Herald, any of the local papers from the 19th century or any newspapers that have been digitised, all you've got to do is go onto that website, put a search in, put your family name in. You have no idea what could be come up. Because these papers were small, and if there was a wedding, or there was a christening, they did an article about it. As there was a fascist movement, but there was a very strong anti-fascist movement in Australia too. And it was centred more in Melbourne, um, with the very famous Matteotti Club. Matteotti was, was an anti-fascist who, of course, was martyred. He became their, um, their mascot, so to speak. There was an anti-fascist newspaper called Lower Cotland at Rick Hoss. In all of this, never one scrap of evidence was ever found from any town that they were going to do anything subversive. With all the internment, not one <coughs> scrap of evidence was ever found. Interesting photograph, because this is uh, Anzac Day, 1937. The Italian ex-servicemen, these are World War I veterans, so they went through Sydney and that was okay still. In fact, I've seen an article where Prime Minister Lyons was learning how to do the fascist symbol when he, when he went to Italy or Germany or somewhere. Um, that, was, that was nothing considered, you know, today we look at that and go, oh my God. But in those days, it was just, oh, that was just Mussolini. Mussolini was always seen as this benign, sawdust kind of Caesar until he got mixed up with old Adolf and everything was changed. But anyway, World War II breaks out and, of course, Menzies declares war in September of 1939. And even though Italy hasn't joined the war until the following year, uh, the New South Wales premiers were really thought the Italians were still going to, they were going to be a problem. And they started doing their investigations before Italy joined the war. And the Commissioner of Police, uh, McKay, who you may remember, he started, set up a whole intelligence section at Sydney Police Headquarters and they started their investigations of Italians. <coughs> the surveillance started then. And some of you may remember uh, your families might have told this story, but Italians were... There's lots of dossiers in the National Archives of lots of observations going on. And I found some of my family that... Yeah. They was just basically watched the house all day, watched everyone who came in, went through the mail, wow. uh, went through the parcels that came, just to see whether they were troublemakers or not. Some of them were troublemakers, some of them weren't. But anyway, so, and of course, New South Wales, I suppose I'm focusing more on New South Wales today because we're here, but the premiers that we had uh, at, during the war really didn't like Italians very much. There was a frenzy, this paranoia, this concern that they were going to be subversive in some way. In fact, the premiers of New South Wales said to the federal government, let's just intern every Italian. Let's just get them all yeah. locked up because they're going to be cause a problem. Of course, that didn't work out. The federal government said, this is ridiculous. It's impossible to do that. Everything changes when Italy 
joins the war um, and declares war on Britain and France. And this is when lives for, life for Italian Australians becomes very difficult. I'm going to show you a little video clip now from, and it's an excerpt from when the war came to Australia. It's on YouTube, so you can go home and have another look at it. Just a little clip in that video, which you can look at on YouTube. So when the war came to Australia, it was made some years ago. Lots of things in that clip that tell us about what happened. The fishing the Cine Sound review that you saw. So that was your <coughs> your dad, they were my great great uncles. Oh, they were yeah. La Valley. They're Bagnados. Yep, and we were the well, I'm descended from the La Valleys. Oh okay. So yeah. they had the boat together, the yeah. San Cristoforo, which was the ship the yeah. boat there. Yeah. Um, that was publicity and that was to show that everything was alright. A couple of months later that one of the men in that uh, La Valley was interned. He was born in America. So he wasn't even born in Italy, but he had gone and joined the fascist party because they told him that he would get a cheap rate to go back to Italy. He was a political man and that, that he didn't have a hope in hell. The Americans wouldn't take him back because he wasn't, they didn't want him either, so he was put in turn that hand. Not a very nice file to read because his wife was not coping very well at all with the family and the letters from the doctors and you'd read all the letters in the file and they just wouldn't, no way, no release. No release. Um, and you saw too at the end Francesca Miranda, who she was a past president of Co Is It Here. Yes. Yes. Her case is interesting because she was in turn, but she'd been born in Australia and she was a woman. And she was a child. And she was a child. Yeah, she was young. Wow. There were children and women were interned. There wasn't a lot of them, but there was one camp called Chachura, which I'll show you in a minute, and that was the only place which had kids and, and, and women. Um, you had to be somebody who they thought could be doing subversive activities or your parents were very, very well known. I'll talk about the other kids a little bit later on, but that's the main thing that happened. So the fact that you're, you were naturalised was no protection against internment. If they thought that you were going to be problematic and they, and you, they thought you had more allegiance for Italy than Australia, you could have had sons fighting in, and you, lots of internees had sons fighting in the Australian forces, sons fighting in the army or the air force, and they were in internment camps. That's the, the strange thing about it all. Straight away, the next day, all the fruit shops got, them, got basically, they were closed up. And if they weren't closed up, they would have had a few things pegged at them and the glass was broken and all that kind of thing. And not everywhere, but a lot of them reported to have that. And of course, their livelihoods were lost because nobody would go and buy anything off these, these enemies anymore. Wow. So the new laws that came in to deal with aliens and Italians was there was a National Security Aliens Control Regulation of 39. So basically, once that declaration of war happened, Italians were not allowed to have cameras, they were not allowed to have a wireless set, you were not allowed to have a bicycle. You were not allowed to have guns, of course, um, because that would be problematic. When we go back to the fishing that we were talking about before, uh, if you were an Italian, you were not allowed to go fishing anymore. You could still own your vessel, but you were not allowed to go fishing. And because you could go and put landmines down in the ocean or you could put nets and you could or you could be out there helping the Japanese come into Sydney Harbour. So Italian fishermen lost their livelihood. And this happened to my um, the boat that you saw on there was was one of my family's boat and the other one was the two Freddies. And what happened was that the American small army <coughs> ships division came and requisitioned those trawlers. And they paid them for them and they were used then to go and take supplies up to New Guinea during the war. So those, those boats that you saw both got, um, well, the San Cristoforo got uh, bombed by the, or got mined by the Japanese. Mm -hmm. And one of the other boats said the two Freddies, yeah, the St. Christopher. And the two Freddies, it survived the war after getting scuttled a few times. But so those, it's funny, those, all those fishing trawlers, most of them were used to go and transport goods and, and troops up to New Guinea. Um, my great-grandfather, who was taken um, 
well, basically lost his livelihood, they're going to put him in a munitions factory to work for the war, which just makes no sense. <laughs> the thing that affects a lot of Italians is the Alien Registration Act. So if you're not an Australian citizen, and you couldn't be Australian citizen, you could only be British citizen back then, Australian citizenship comes in after World War II. So if you're not a naturalised British subject, you are an alien, and you have to register. And you have to go to the local police, doesn't matter if you're old, young, whatever, get your fingerprints taken, sign your declaration, and you have to go and report regularly. And that was what happened. And if you didn't do that, then I'll tell you what happened if you didn't do that. So you had to have your identity card on you all the time and all that kind of thing. So I'll talk about my mother's side of the family, the Casey family, who were from a country town called Leeton. And they were the kind of compliant Italians that the authorities wanted because they did what they were told and did all their registration. They didn't get interned as a result of that. So you see on the, the, on the far left there, so that was Ferdinando, Alfonso, Francesco. The Francesco is my grand, grandfather. And there's um, Alfonso and Francesco at the top in their orchard in Leeton. This is the kinds of paperwork that I found in the National Archives about her. So she's an older lady by that time and she has to sign a form of, or she has to go, the, she's signed on to the police in Leeton and she has basically applied for her alien registration. So you can see her fingerprints down the bottom, all her particular, the poor thing has had to put a cross there for her signature because they were not taught to read and write, were they? <laughs> And it's interesting, this other piece of paper that you can see that she's had to sign, it says, I, Teresa Lucchese, of Farm 285 Leeton, <coughs> of Italian nationality, undertake that I will neither directly nor indirectly take any action in any way prejudicial to the safety of the British Empire during the present war. So she's had to sign that. Then I found this other thing in her file. <coughs> the police have gone through all their mail. Um, before it got to them, and there's, it doesn't have the actual letters left, but they've got their notes about what was in the letters. They're all in Italian. She was trying to get letters to her daughters, which were still in Italy, and she sent them via relatives in America, thinking that because America hadn't joined the war at that stage, I don't think they have. Yeah, 1941 it's, hasn't happened yet, Pearl Harbor. So she sent the letters to America so they could get them to Italy, thinking they'd get it to Italy. Um, but anyway, so. It all gone through their mail, basically. Yeah. My grandfather, similar kind of thing. He's got. He's only 17 here, so he's pretty young, and he's done his fingerprints, his signature, and he's got his little ID card. The other document's interesting because he wanted to apply for a driver's license during the war, and they said, "No way, you can't drive. You're not allowed to have kerosene for a. You're not allowed to have gasoline for a start." And, but he says, you know, I've got to get the fruit to the cannery. I've got to get it to the market. And they said, no. So he keeps applying. You see all this. So these, when you go to the National Archives, they've got all the letters there. They've kept everything. And eventually they let him get his driver's licence when he was 22. So it was towards the end of the war. But he could only drive between 6am and 6pm every day except for <coughs> Sundays. He couldn't drive on Sundays. And he wasn't allowed to leave the district. Okay, at the end of the war, he got his naturalisation and he was alright. So they didn't get interned; they were actually their farm was producing, you know, the crops for the government anyway. So I think because they'd been here a bit longer, <coughs> it was an affable kind of fellow. They had some neighbours that were very sort of prominent um, Australian, you know, those old spinster types. His fathers were generals and all that, living next door, and that, I think that was what protected them um, from getting interned. Because if you did what they asked you to, um, they saw you as compliant and that you weren't going to be problematic. A little bit different for those who were interned. This is a photo from Love Day. There's not a lot of photos of internees. Um, there's a few in the Australian War Memorial, but not a lot. So um, this is when they were just moving from one of the camps. They're all Italian internees. Uh, just a point to make between the difference between internees and prisoners of war because that gets mixed up a lot and it's very different. Uh, internees are civilians like you and me. They're not combatants, they're not in the army, they're not in the navy, they're not anything like that. So about 5,000 Italians in Australia were interned. 
So 10% of the Italian community, between 5 and 6, there's a bit of, not quite 100% sure yet, there's not a deadline figure because you've got to include um, those people who were captured, well, that were living in British territory. So for example, in Palestine, there were Italians living in Palestine and that was under the British. The British didn't, they wanted to intern them, but they sent them to Australia to be interned. So they, the British wanted to get, basically they used Australia as a dumping ground. Dumping so ground. Visual? Again. <laughs> Again. All right. Now look, this is a very high figure of internment because if you compare to what happened in America, there's a huge population of Italians in America at the time. In fact, 10% of the soldiers that were fighting in World War II, American soldiers were Italian-American. Um, <coughs> Out of 650,000 alien, Italian aliens in, in America, less than, I think there's about 1,800 were interned. And so in America, they didn't go into this frenzy that they did in Australia. And in fact, in America, they have actually gone to lengths to apologise nationally for, the state of California has done an apology. Well, we'll keep working on that. <laughs> um, prisoners of war are different. Okay, they are combatants, they are soldiers, or they're from the, you know, the, the, the Navy or the Air Force, who are captured by the enemy forces. So what happened during the war, and this is a topic of probably another talk altogether. I don't know whether you realise, but the Australian Army captured 18,000 Italian soldiers in Northern Africa. I mean, a lot of them said, take us, we don't want to be here. <laughs> But, but not, 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 you know what I mean, their lovers not fighters, let's face it. Anyway, um, so 18,000 Italian soldiers captured Northern Africa, and where did they bring them? Brought them here. So 18,000 soldiers were brought to work. Basically, they were put in the same camps as the internees, but different compounds. They weren't mixed up. And because they were seen as, they weren't being rebellious, they were being quite compliant, they decided to use them for the manpower shortages, so they would send them in groups of twos or whatever to farms, and they'd go and work on the farms and live with the families, and they had to wear maroon uniforms. And they seemed to have, I mean, I'm talking generally here, but it seemed to be quite a positive experience. They, they're not a lot of negative stuff that I've read. Uh, the biggest problem was the relationships they form with some of the farmers' wives. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, there's a lot of records about there being a bit of a problematic that way. So that's a topic of something completely different. But there people are, are dumbfounded when you say there was eighteen thousand Italian soldiers in Australia during the war. And it took them a few years to get back because there were no ships to take them back to Italy. So yeah, forty seven, some of them were even a bit later, yeah. All right, this map of Australia, I know it's a bit hard to see, but this shows you where all the internment camps were in Australia during World War II. Some of these are POW camps too. But the majority of them, of course, are down, um, down in New South Wales and Victoria and, and Adelaide. There's a couple in Western Australia. Tasmania had sort of one, but we don't sort of... That doesn't come up a lot in the records to do with Italians. Um, more, to, more people got interned from Queensland was the place where most of them came from uh, because, and they got interned a bit later because of the Japanese invasions in the north, so they got a bit worried that they would, you know, shake hands with the Japanese and start doing bad things in Australia. So Queensland had a lot, New South Wales had a lot, um, Western Australia had quite a lot too. Victoria had the most, the least because Mannix was very powerful down in with, in with politics. So Archbishop Bishop Mannix had um, a lot of, he had a lot to do with the Italian community, very involved. His housekeepers were Italian, I think they were Vagonas. And, and of course, he was able to offer some protection, but it didn't happen the same way in Sydney, and that's why more were, able, more were interned. So if you lived in Victoria, you had less, they were still interning people, but not to the extent of Queensland or even New South Wales. So yes, the main ones that we probably talk about tonight, Orange uh, was you know, an early camp, it wasn't one of the, the ones that was there for the duration. Cow, of course, where the Japanese breakout was, the Italians were there too, but in a different compound. So when we're talking about compounds, 
we've got, we're talking like acres between these compounds. Um, you, they didn't have anything to do with each other. The Italians and Japanese were kept well apart. Um, their cow, of course, we talked about. Uh, Liverpool was more for the power, or for the POWs. Yenko was more for the POWs as well. It was a holding camp too, for internees. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been. They were sort of interused them all. They moved them all. They moved them on all the time. Hay, Myrtle Fall down in, in Victoria. Um, and we'll talk about these as we go through. But the main ones, of course, Tatura in Victoria was the family camp, which I'll talk, tell you about. Love Day in South Australia was a very massive camp, a very big one as well. All right, so first in turn, I talk about my other grandfather, uh, Giuseppe Musico. And this is a photo that was taken... Uh, before he left Italy. So when he left Italy in 1938, he married my grandmother and they'd been married for a few months and he left to come to Australia and, and left my grandmother. She was expecting my father at the time. And he came to help his brothers out in Queensland. They were farmers in Stanthorpe, stayed there for a bit, then decided he was going to go back to Rome where he'd done a bit of work and went to see his sister down in Cabramatta, which is all bush in those days, rural area, and then the war broke out, and so he got stuck. So to find your records regarding anything to do with internment or even to do with um, your families who wasn't interned, to find out the alien registration or anything, World War I records, anything that was to do with... Australia from 1901, this is the website to go to. It's the National Archives of Australia record search. And it's not all being catalogued. It's, you need to keep checking it all the time, but it's got a really good... Most of the internee stuff's all done, and if you're looking for World War I records of Anzacs or whatever, they're all being done as well. Uh, so when you put in a name, you'll get at least something like this will come up. All right, so I've just put in my surname. Now, when you... I'll just try and make that a bit bigger for you. All right, so you put in a name and up comes a few things. So in the, the corner there, you'll see access status. If it has open, means you can go and have a look at that record. But if it has, like down the bottom here, not yet examined, it means it hasn't been looked at since it was made. And you may ha I've had to apply for all mine to be opened because they need to check them to make sure there's nothing in there that security information that should still not be released. So it's not un uncommon to get records with names blotted out of the people that dot them in or the people that uh, who, who arrested them. You'll find that there can be pages taken out, but not a very common, it's not a major thing, but if you find a record that interests you and you have to apply for access, and that can take a couple of months, and they'll go through it. It also tells you the location of the record. So you've got Brisbane or Darwin or Canberra. Wherever they were interned is where the records will be. So as we mentioned, the, the, they move them on. And so my grandfather was in New South Wales, South Australia, Western Australia, Northern Territory. They moved them on. And so wherever that time was, there'll be a record in that office. So if you find a record you want, you can either go to the office and, and look at it, or if you want to get it digitised, if you see, <coughs> that, if you see that little page icon, that means it's already been digitised, and you can press that and it comes up on the screen. So those pictures I've been showing you are those digitised ones. So you can apply for all that. It just takes time. It can get expensive. They charge you by the, how thick the file is, and some of these internment files are very thick, so it can cost you like, quite a bit of money, but it's worth getting. Um, so, yes, you can apply. And, of course, the Sydney office is in Chester Hill of the National Archives, right next door to Villawood Detention Centre. It's quite <laughs> easy to find. There is also another index if you want to find out if somebody was interned in your family. Coas are down in Melbourne. They are very into historical things, not so much family history, but very much into preserving heritage. They have an index that you can put a name in and it will tell you their number and all that kind of thing as well. So that's worth having a look at too, if you want to. Um, so looking at these records, this is... Um, my grandfather's what happened, and I'll, I'll, I know it's hard to see. So what happened was that 
oh, this is the police report when they came to visit you. And he was farming at the time. Alien was found in a shack in scrub land at Bonnyrigg and stated he could speak no English. He was taken to his married sister's home, which was his address. His brother-in-law stated he did not advise Alien to register as he minds his own business. <laughs> Our new neighbour states that, the, that, that he de she definitely advised Alien to register, but he shook his head and laughed. He was taken to Liverpool Police Station and detained. We are of the opinion that his movement should be restricted. Oh. And he has disobeyed the law. That's what it has there. Now, he didn't even, from the records, he didn't even know that Italy had even declared war <coughs> for months afterwards. And he was, you can imagine, living out on a farm, didn't yeah. know what was going on, didn't understand the language, had no intention of staying, <coughs> probably. And so the police came out, did this, yeah. this report, and then they came back a couple of days later to arrest him. And when they arrested him, this is what they describe what he had with him. So he had his, um, they gave you, if you were lucky, if you were, when you were arrested to have enough time to get a few things together. So if they said you could pack your bags, you were lucky. Some of the people were just from the accounts in that book that we've been talking about. Just arrested in front of the kids, in front of the screaming wives, terrible traumatic things that were going, they were just taken. So it depended on, on how lucky you were with whichever um, police officers that you had. But um, you know, the, one of the saddest cases I've read, and it's in that book, Hidden Lives, is of this family in Queensland. The wife of the family, the white mother, had died, and the father was Sicilian. He had, was dressed in black from top to toe, black shirt. And they thought, oh, well, you're a fascist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they interned him, and the kids were left destitute and went to put in orphanages during the war. Um, one of the things about internment, which is really terrible, is that nothing, no provisions were made for the families. They were interned, and you can imagine some of these women out on these farms in the middle of nowhere were just left to just battle it on. Um, that was one of the worst parts about internment, because the breadwinners were taken away. Yeah, so it sh shows you exactly what he had at the time of capture. <coughs> And it talks about he's got clothing and bedding and a lease for the farm that he was farming. And it talks about how many crops he had. And then the lease that they, when he got captured, um, his brother-in-law wanted the lease so he could farm it at least. And they it mysteriously had gone, which is a very common thing that we found that um, in the files, the internees' belongings went walkabouts sometimes. And like Prince Del Drago, who I've talked about, his gold watch didn't survive his arrest. He never saw it again. So when he got interned, um, he was taken to Long Bay Jail like all of them were in New South Wales. And to, I've never had, I'm lucky, I've never actually had to go inside Long Bay Jail, but it's not very pretty from the photos I see. It's fine inside. You enjoyed your stay. <laughs> but the sad part was they put them in the venereal disease wing. The internees got stuck in these horrible conditions. Um, at one stage, it was seen as breaching the Geneva Convention, which was sets out the rules of war for prisoners. Um, and then that slowly got through to pull it, the, the government, and they quickly fixed things up because if they had broken the Geneva Convention, well, then you, you know, you had breached international law. The Japanese, of course, never signed a Geneva Convention, so that's why they did all the things that they did. All right, so. This was his arrest, captured, and of course sent to Orange internment camp after Long Bay. That was a holding camp. I think some of it they were in the showground. And, um, yeah. It was all done very haphazardly. They didn't know what to do with all these people. So when he gets into the camp, they say, <coughs> time for you to sign your alien registration form. And so he signed it. And I'm lucky because there's some photos with these. Um, sometimes you will find some photos in these files if you're lucky. Uh, some people don't. Some of them have gone walk walkabouts, don't know where they've gone. But anyway, so they finally got him to sign his alien registration form. <laughs> Handprints, signatures, all that kind of thing, and all the particulars about when he arrived, his next of kin, all that kind of thing. So these files have got a lot in them, if you can you find something of your, to do with your family. So 
it's all that sort of routine. The other thing too is that you can get too is a whole internee service and casualty form which lists every camp they went to and when. It's a very similar to a you know a soldier record. If you look at say um, the ANZAC records from World War One, they have it like that. So it tells you where he was and when he left and when he was Are marched onto the next. Camp. Yes, from Calabria, Orpidon. from a place called Orpidon, Yes. And every time they moved a camp, then they had to fill in another piece of paperwork called a uh, notice of change of abode. So every camp they went to, they had to change. They actually had to apply for permission to move on. They didn't have the right to. Uh, they didn't have any choice in it, but they had to. to of course, and you can see this one has gone from orange to hay. Uh, so the thing is, with all of this, these records are great. They give us a good insight into where they were and when, but we don't get an insight into. They never report on their conduct very much, unless they did something really bad. We don't know their first-hand accounts or anything like that. There's been, maybe we've got about a handful, maybe I can count on my hand how many diaries we've got from the internment camps, there's not many. It was not a thing that's been talked about a lot. It's sort of like once they got out, they just got on with their lives, that kind of attitude they were looking forward. So there's not a lot first-hand accounts. There's a few, but not a lot. Here's an example of a letter that he got in the camp in Love Day from his niece. But as you can see, it's been opened by a censor. So all of their mail, of course, was read through before it got to them. And then they used that as evidence against them. You'll find other papers later on. They've quoted things from the letter. Um, he was, there was a lot of, in his files, there's so much correspondence because his, his sister, his nieces, his brothers in Queensland, they were always writing to the authorities trying to get him released. Oh, we've got contract, government contract for all this farming. Please let him out because we need his, you know, he can help us, all that kind of thing. Um, even one of the members of the parliament member for where it was is now was a, a Hubert Lazzarini, who was of Italian stock. Yeah, they wrote to him, but he couldn't. Once, once you had not declared that you were an alien, you had no hope in hell of getting out. And also, the fact that he had relatives still in Italy, they saw that as he could still conspire. So it was very, very much. Here's a um, something that he made in the camp that's treasured by our family. It's about 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres. He made this in hay, and it's it's a beautiful it's set for <coughs> photos. And it says his name. Prison. He's written himself as a prisoner of war because it's probably you know what he thought he was at the time. And beautifully decorated. But that was one of the things that the internees did during during the war. A lot of modern work. There were a lot of artistic kind of attributes because you had an option. You could work, and they paid you. I think. Five shillings a day. Five, shilling. Five shillings, yep. But a lot of the internees, I have a 96 year old uncle who still was interned, and he said, oh, We said, bugger them, why should we work? They've put us here, so I'm not, we're not going to work. Some of them went out and worked and got paid their five shillings a day and saved up, and others of them, they, played, they grew their own veggies, they did lots of things. But it's not to say it was a holiday camp because they were still held captive and they were still. Um, um, they were still held captive and they still had to you know, have roll call in the morning and drills and all those kinds of things. So it was not a picnic as some, some scholars have sort of tried to make it out to be. There's a lot of... The, Mia Spitziger, who's the editor of that book, Hidden Live, she's interviewed the last lot, really. She's, gone, she's from Melbourne and she's done a magnificent amount of work. And she says, you know, there's some lots of very nice stories that she's recorded, which is going to come out in her thesis, so I have to wait for that to come out. But there was, there was some not nice things happening. There was, there was certainly physical <coughs> abuse in some of those camps. <coughs> so just to give you a rundown of the different camps, so Orange I've mentioned before to you was one of the first ones. A Hay also in New South Wales. This was an example of the money that was used in the camps. So these are in the internment coins. If you've got one of those, they're worth a lot of money because they were all melted down after the war. Worth, I'm not talking about 20 bucks. I'm talking and very talking. Some of them are worth thousands of dollars. And the camp money to the paper money, again, worth a lot of money. So they have like little canteens and if you'd worked a bit, you'd get your little 50 shillings and you'd buy back your cigarettes or whatever you wanted. 
So again, have a look at home, you might have one. <laughs> this is a, a love day, was one of the other camps we've mentioned a lot. This is as they're leaving the camp. South Australia, massive camp there. And so the conditions were pretty spartan that they were living in. They were huts, they were hot, dusty, didn't have much, a lot of running water. It was you know, very hot out there, as you can imagine. Cowra, of course, the more famous one. Again, you can see this is a very big aerial shot of Cowra. The four different compounds. And of course, you know, the difference, yeah, Italian POWs in one, Italian civilian internees. Of course, remember, the Germans have got kind of interned as well. Um, so they were, the Germans copped it in World War One. they were interned in World War One as well, so both, both wars. Um, and the Japanese, of course, both civilian Japanese, because you had the consular staff in Australia. The Japanese in Australia, um, not massive numbers, but they were interned as well. This camp is in Victoria. It's the only camp that had women and children in it. So whole families were interned. Now some of those families were the ones I talked about from Palestine, that they had been Italians living in Palestine, British mandate over it, and then they sent them to Australia to be interned. So there are a lot of those families. Um, women, so there were not a lot of women interned, but Francesca Miranda was one of them that you saw in that video. Australian born, um, thought she was a spy. They didn't know what to do with her because both her parents were put into camps from northern, from Tully up in Queensland. Uh, so this camp had, and of course, those women that were leaders in the Fasci Femminili, so the Italian the female branch of the Sydney Fascist Party, or the Fascist Parties all over Australia, they, they were interned as well. Their files are interesting to read. So Tatura was a different camp. And the book Hidden Lives has the accounts of a couple of the children that were born in this camp. It's a very different perspective of it. That's the good thing about what Mia's work has done is that she has um, looked at the transgenerational effect of internment and the fact that these kids were born behind the wires and and yeah they, they've they've written their accounts though a couple of those people. So it was a different sort of camp altogether. The other one that was in Victoria. That's oops. Sorry. Uh, Murchison. Now the interesting, this is the Osario. Every intern, Italian internee that died during the war, or POW, Italian POW, they, they were sent here to be buried. And that's inside, they've built like this special, like crypts I suppose, and that's the, the remains of those. There's a, over a hundred, or something. Over a hundred uh, internees died during the war. There were a couple of murders in the camps, which I'll talk about briefly. There were suicides and there was illness. There was a lot of elderly people interned. Um, so there's a lot of other things that that happened there too. So Murchison is interesting. So one of the stories in the book was about a family whose father had died, didn't know that he died. They buried him all over the countryside, kept exhuming him a couple of times, and he ended up in there in the end. They didn't know anything about this, the family. Um, another place that's interesting um, is Harvey in Western Australia. This is a, the internees that were there built this lovely altar, and they've still preserved it, actually, so you can go there today and see, see that over there. But there is a few other camps, but I thought they were the more uh, interesting ones to show you. Some of the interesting internees, um, it's interesting to note that there's a lot of Italian, a lot, there's quite a few of Italian Jewish internees, so they had escaped Italy. So Mark Tedeschi has talked about his family before the Crown Prosecutor. There's also the Accorso brothers. Um, here they fled the madmen of Europe, but they had Italian passports. And of course, uh, you know, the word for Jew in Italian starts with an E, not a J, so the Australian authorities thought that they were, didn't realise. So they were interned as well. There are quite a few artists that were interned in these camps. Um, Lamberto Yonna is a very famous artist. Lots of his works at the War Memorial and, and plays. Uh, Cesare Vaccarini, who's this chap here with the goatee. He was an artist in Palestine, Italian Franciscans. Uh, he was working on the Franciscan uh, church in Palestine. Beautiful frescoes. <coughs> And of course he was in turn brought to Australia, he was in turn in Chatura, and then the Franciscans at Waverley here in New South Wales said, uh, we'll look after you, come here, you can work in our church. So if you ever go to Mary Immaculate at Waverley, that church, it's down the bottom there, all the frescoes in there were done by him during the war. That's how they kept him out of trouble. So 
the church has done that in a couple of cases I've found where they, they sort of said, we'll keep them under our protection. Uh, the other famous one, we've talked about Prince Alfonso del Drago at the top there. He, in that photo, is the last man to leave Lovego, <coughs> and he, he was camp commandant there because of his association with the Italian community. They made him top dog in the camp, so basically he uh, was the mediator between the camp um, leaders, the, camp, the military officials and the Italian internees. He's an interesting story. I think someone could write a book on him. Italian nobility um, came out, I don't know, researching. I think our love interest had brought him to Australia. This very big property over at Quakers Hill when it was all rural. And I don't know, he was having an affair with a lady called uh, Baroness Avanzo, another Italian noble lady who was actually a pioneering racing, car racing driver. She was. Yeah. She was. She was. But anyway, I don't think things worked out because she went back. I don't know what happened there. Uh, Antonio Baccarini was the president of the Dante Alighieri Society. He was a very notable um, linguist. And the other guy up here in the, more, the, the top here is uh, Francesco Fantin. He was murdered in Love Day. He was an anti-fascist. And the fascists, there were little conglomerates of more hardliners. And what's happened, you stick people together you get them, they sort of become a little bit, some of them become a bit more extreme. Um, big, people have written whole books about this whole case, but anyway, eventually they had a bit of an altercation, got hit over the head with something and then he died. And so he's buried at Murchison, but yeah, an interesting case in itself. Um, you had one chance to appeal your internment, <coughs> and this is my grandfather's, uh, the transcript, you were brought to Sydney, and you were given a chance to prove your case, but at the end of the day, they said it goes through all information about you know, his capture and why he was captured. And basically, again, it was he didn't register as an alien, has no regard for his country, therefore, and that because his family is still in Italy, he's just we don't think that we can let him out. And very few got released. It was seen as a, like a legal thing, but very few got released. So by 43, those who interned uh, tended to get released in what they call the Civil Alien Corps because they wanted to ease manpower shortages. And plus, of course, Italy's, the war in Italy, of course, Mussolini and Tobin is losing it quite easily by then. So they were released into these sort of like work gangs. So they were working on government projects like uh, train tracks and laying sleepers in Western Australia, in South Australia, Northern Territory. And they had to basically say, you know, he has had to say what his statement is. And he's saying, look, I'm not a fascist. I've never been a fascist. Um, but he says, I'm Italian. And my sympathies are with Italy, but I'm not a fascist. And I'm happy want to. I want to work. These are my brother's address. Let me go. Anyway, they weren't allowed. They wouldn't let him go back to his family, but they said you can go and work in these <coughs> train projects. Um, so, and that's what most of them were released and put into these. So they didn't have their own, they didn't have their freedom, but they weren't in a camp anymore. But they were sort of like in a work game, sort of that kind of situation. And they got paid a little bit. So I suppose the thing is, where to from now? There was a reunion of internees in 1990 at Parliament House in Sydney. Wow. There he is. They had a lunch and all that kind of thing, got the internees back together. There's been a, 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 a try to put motions in Parliament in 1990. There's been motions in South Australia. There's been motions in, par in the State Parliament in Western Australia too. But that's as far as it's got. There's never been a national apology or anything like that has ever happened. But, you know, there is a guy, Zangari, who's an MP for Fairfield. He's been in correspondence with me and he's been trying to put a motion into New South Wales Parliament about, about the internment. Um, in America, as I said to you, in America, they've done a bit of apologising for it. Canada's done a really massive amount of work into apologising for it. They've even funded museums and monuments and they've done a lot of work. But again, they didn't intern anywhere near the number of internees that, that were happening in Australia. Britain uh, interned about the same amount, but their population was far greater. So Australia went crazy with all this internment. So yeah, the situation of course is a bit different to overseas. But anyway, so that's the, probably one of the last photos of a group shot of all the internees. Um, before I 
go. I just want to say, if any of you wanted to look up your passenger arrivals of your family when they came to Australia, you go in National Archives, record search again, and if you put in a name, you'll get, um, you know, say, for example, I've looked up my grandfather here, and they're all digitised, so you can look them up. It'll tell you what ship they're on, and then it goes to the actual manifest document, and you can read who they were on the ship with and where they went and all that kind of thing. I think that sort of concludes what um, I want to speak to you tonight. So, if any questions? That was great. That was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> any recorded um, cases of death from from the like the, the military keepers at all? Or Not that I'm aware of, but still, there's so much to still research to be done yet. Yeah. All these children were given um, like cultural. What's the word? courses to do at university or that kind of thing and I was sitting next to one of the sons who was going to Sicily to help keep uh, talk about keep the dialect in the schools and, and because of his father's contribution all the children were given these things by the government as a uh, like a thank you or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was in fact a, a Sicilian uh, St. Ives here yes. in Sydney, yeah, and in fact, take us down to St. Ives Showground. Yep. Were you, would you be able to... <coughs> yeah, it was a prisoner of war camp, not an internment one, definitely, yes. Uh, I'll never forget the 10th of June 1940, a Monday, coming home from school. Yes. As the tram pulled into Eddy Avenue, the paper boy screamed out, Italy enters the war. <laughs> Within a half an hour, I walked into the shop. Mum was crying. Dad's gone. Oh. Oh. Francesca, I'm here with my sister Anna. Our father was in that parliament um, photograph there. Yeah. What did you find out when you talked to internees about life in a camp? Because our father, and, and he was a single man, and, and our uncle was in, in the camp as well. Uh, he didn't leave behind uh, children like this fellow uh, in front here. But um, he, he'd had a ball. I mean, he talked so positively about his time uh, living in a tent. He absolutely loved it. Yeah. Well, considering how hard they were working before they got put away, it was it for a lot of them. It was a bit of a break. Um, so, what was their surname? If you don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Went to Cowra, Victoria, and Tasmania. Okay. Yeah. And then back to Sydney, and then. And he worked. And stayed in Sydney. He went out to work. Oh, the biggest and we're problem. We're not aware that we've got other siblings. So. We'd heard that story before. <laughs> um, the biggest problem was communication to get back in the case of my, my father and he was in Italy and my father was here. The only way they would get messages back to Italy was through a Vatican radio. So the apostolic delegate in Australia, the Pope's representative, um, that was he used to come out to the camps and see them and he got messages through Vatican Radio back to their family. So there's a couple little scraps of paper in one of the files saying that he contacted his mother saying, I'm in a camp, but I'm OK. That's, that's the kind of communication. Uh, Western Australia, you go to Chicharello as a Fremantle on the wharf there. There's uh, four or six uh, 200 by 200 posts with all the names of the official. And, about 95% of Italians, and below there's a plaque stating that during the war, they confiscated the licences of the fishing. But about six or eight weeks later, they realised they had no fish to eat. <laughs> I know the daughter is a Catholic school teacher of a, an internee from Cowra, and I've read the papers that she's given me, she wouldn't let me take them home, but she still got them. And her father was transferred to Liverpool at one stage, and it wasn't anywhere near as good as Cowra, because in Cowra they were allowed out, as you said, to go out and work on farms. But at Liverpool, it was a different story. They, they actually locked them up. And this guy eventually saved a bit of money, and he escaped one night, caught the train to Central, when he got to Central, he went to the ticket office and said, look, um, I'd like to buy a ticket to it. Where, what's the furthest place that trains go to? <laughs> and the guy said, Canamble. He said, I'll have one. <laughs> so he took a ticket, he went to Canamble, he got out of the train at Canamble, he walked down the street, he walked into a farm, 
knocked on the door and said to the guy, my name is John Negrin and I look for job. And the guy said to him, oh yeah, you look like John Green. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, this guy employed him and um, kept him there throughout the whole of the war. And at the end of the war, he gave himself up. He went back to Italy, he married his sweetheart, he brought her back to Canamble, he kept working for this guy, and when this guy died, he left him the farm. Oh, wow.